Hello and welcome to It'll Be Alright in the 90s, the podcast that always finishes its dinner before 6pm on a Friday in order to catch The Simpsons on BBC Two. I'm one of your hosts, Alex Bleeding Gums Greenwood, and my co-host is Disco Stew. Uh, <laughs> I resisted the urge to call you Sideshow Stew, which I thought might have undermined our sort of equal footing as co-hosts. But, uh, <laughs> so I went for Disco Stew instead, but um, how are you? That's absolutely fine. Uh, hello, Alex. Hello, listeners. Uh, yes, I went by Disco Stew for a long time. That was my MSN Messenger handle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he was even my profile picture. So yes, Disco Stew, a Simpsons character very close to my heart, and I'm proud to be associated with him. Of course, yeah. It was very hard to find someone to fit your name and actually my name in, uh, Simpsons character-wise, which is why I had to go for Bleeding Gums Greenwood, which I think you've called me before, maybe. I may have done. I'm not sure. But, uh, I mean, it, it certainly fits. It certainly trips off the tongue. I, I like yeah. it. So I think you've picked well. Yeah. Uh, this is, of course, because we'll be talking about the first two series or seasons of The Simpsons uh, later in the episode. Uh, can we just establish now where we stand on using the term season versus series? Because I always say series out of a sense of possibly misguided patriotism, because I think seasons feels quite American. But I don't know, seasons is a bit easier to enunciate. Um, I tend to say series for uh, UK produced programmes and then the seasons for US produced programmes, mm. I have to say. I tend yeah. to tailor it to the uh, to the nationality of the programme. Yeah, um, so, so yeah, I would, I would say uh, seasons of The Simpsons, but I would say series of Taskmaster, for instance. Yeah, okay. Okay, from that point on then this episode, I will be saying the word seasons. Um, but rest assured... Of course, we are coming up to the coronation of the king. I don't want anyone to doubt my patriotism by using that term. It is purely, uh, as Stu said, logic based on it being an American series. So not that I need I, to explain myself. I just need to step in and I've, I've realised that I've provided a non-90s example of a UK television series. So can I just say, um, I would say series for Robot Wars, for instance. Yes. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Taskmaster well, well spotted, yeah. didn't even start till 2015. Uh, I wondered what you were talking about. <laughs> before we go any further today's episode does have a sponsor and it is sponsored by dixon's so if you head down to your local branch of dixon's and quote the code all right 90s you can get 10 percent off their entire matsui range including their mcr 535 portable television radio cassette player combo and their ph6120 portable two band radio and cassette player so head down there and have a browse of what's on offer and make a fantastic saving courtesy of It'll be all right in the 90s and Dixon's. The future for less. Thank you very much to Dixon's. I always remember about Dixon's in Emery Gate, the shopping centre in Chippenham. Mm -hmm. They invariably had a TV um, that had a camera set up that was pointing out of the shop and the feed from the camera was being displayed on the TV. (laughs) So you would see yourself walking past the shop. And that was always there. And I'm not entirely sure why, because presumably it was technology that you weren't able to by yourself unless it was display demonstrating a camcorder i'm not sure but um, that's my my main memory of dixon's uh, in the 90s is is seeing myself walking past the shop on the tv always a always a nice moment yeah i, I also remember that it was a real bus wasn't it to see yourself on tv <laughs> um and i mean there's the famous sort of anecdote that people will always say about seeing people crowd around the outside the window of a dixon's or a curry's to watch some famous football result come in or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, that sort of died out, hasn't it? I don't think you really get that anymore. I don't example. think you do. No, it's it's very much the the age of the of the app now. The uh, I use yeah. Flash Score myself. If any, I'm not. I listen. I'm not taking money from them. I'm just saying, Flash Score is my is my score app of choice. Mm-hmm. Um, just while while we bring up uh, while we bring up football, I'll be making a pilgrimage I haven't made since 1997. In a couple of weeks' time. Uh, because would you believe it, at the uh, charity match for John Bolland that the podcast sponsored uh, at the weekend, which was a great event, very, very happy to to be associated with it and be involved in it, um, I managed to win two tickets for the Villa Spurs game uh, in a couple wow. of weeks' time. So, wow. so I'll be heading up to uh, to Villa Park for that. Can you believe it? That's amazing. What a great, what a great prize and a fantastic day, hopefully. Absolutely. And all the money going to, to a great charity as well, obviously. So, so it works both ways. It's, it's win-win. Um, but yeah, no, can't wait. Absolutely. (laughs) 
time for some correspondence now. Stu, I think you've got a couple of things in the mailbag over there. Yes, I do. Uh, both around the video games of 1995, which we discussed a couple of episodes ago. Uh, Stephen Robbs, uh, our correspondent, gets in touch and says, Super Mario World 2 at Yoshi's Island for the SNES is my game of 95. Having been really impressed by Rare's Donkey Kong Country graphics, Nintendo instructed Shigeru Miyamoto to make a realistic looking game. So in Rebellion, he deliberately made this to have a completely hand-drawn style. And he also says, I think the Ridge Racer loading screen game was called Gallagher, but I haven't Googled to check. I think that he is correct on that. I think it was called Gallagher, G-A-L-A-G-A. Um, that, I think that was definitely the, the name of the game. Didn't Brother of the Pod Adam come across Ridge Racer Revolution on his travels uh, recently, just after the episode was published? He did, yeah. He found it in the charity shop uh, in the original case, um, but he resisted the urge to buy it. I, I panicked when he first told me this. I thought maybe he'd he'd missed uh, a potential gold mine. But uh, upon some research, they don't actually go for very much on eBay. So mm-hmm. still, I suppose there's probably still a lot still knocking around because it was such a big seller. Um, so he didn't buy it, but they are still out there if you look. Absolutely. Retrace the revolution. Get yourself on it. Uh, Alex Mitchell, regular correspondent, also says FIFA 2000 was released in October 1999. So you can just about discuss it. It was a cracking game. I used to play it all the time. Do I remember rightly that Ronaldo wasn't on it and he was down simply as number nine instead? I have something in the back of my head saying that he had his own Ronaldo branded game or something. Uh, well, he was just down as number nine uh, in FIFA 2000. They weren't actually allowed to use the Ronaldo name. I'm not sure if he had his own game. It was definitely an image rights uh, type issue, which meant that um, EA weren't allowed to to use the Ronaldo name or image uh, in, in FIFA 2000. So well remembered, Alex. Um, I loved FIFA 2000, probably my favourite of the, of the FIFA games. I had it on PC uh, and I played it endlessly. It was the first time uh, really that I customized or made up my own team I, I used a team customizer to make a team called Laycock Town who played in orange and black um, and I made up all the names and I made up all the like, different backstories for the players I had little pen pictures for them um, I can still remember them all now uh, they're, they're, they're dear dear friends for me to this day um, Laycock <laughs> Town on FIFA 2000 they won the lot they were they were a great side oh but they did who, who was your top scorer uh, we had uh, a Scottish uh, striker called Willie McIntosh um, who regularly scored upwards of 150 goals a season. Um, so, I mean, what, what more could you ask for? This guy was a real, real, uh, you know, crack striker. Time for What's the Most 90s, and to mark the recent sad passing of chat show legend Jerry Springer. Um, Alex, I want to know this week what our Most 90s chat show hosts are, please. I really struggled with this one for some reason. I just couldn't think of anyone. I did eventually plump for someone but i want to give a quick mention to arsenio hall in america who i think was quite a big well he was quite i mean he was big he was a big recognizable name he had a a show over there called the arsenio hall show i think in the early 90s i think that was quite a groundbreaking show in terms of mainstream representation at the time but i haven't gone for him because i never saw it and that's much more of an american thing uh, and so I've gone more UK based and I've gone for Robert Kilroy Silk, uh, eventually landed on him, unfortunately. Um, and he, so he's not a face you see on TV anymore at all, I don't think. I think obviously he, he went into politics after TV. And can you remember the the political party he set up, Stu? Oh, Veritas. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well remembered. In, in 2005, set them up and did all sorts of political nonsense. Uh, but before that, he was a big... <laughs> TV personality over here in the UK it was um, I think it was just called Kilroy was his his TV program throughout the 90s started in the late 80s and yeah so that's why I've chosen him I didn't really want to choose him I didn't really want to mention him but he just he was the only one I could think of who was so 90s you know people like Richard and Judy were quite big in the 2000s and Richard Madeley still all over the TV now people like Trisha you know, a bit too 2000s I thought so that's why I've gone for Kilroy Silk, basically. I think he was he's trapped in the 90s where he belongs. And yeah, that he's my choice for the most 90s chat show host. It's a great you? choice. I, I think uh, th- this may stray into the 2000s slightly, but I'm fairly sure late 90s, early 2000s, he graduated to game show host. And he had, mm. a, he had a game show game show called Shafted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I believe. No, and the, big, just... the big catchphrase was, will they share or shaft? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. And it was that prisoner's dilemma thing at the end, which also happened on Golden Balls and a lot of other mm. uh, TV programs after that, where it was if they both say they're going to share, then they will get a share of the money. But if one of them says steal, uh, and if they both say steal, then neither of them get anything. Mm. Um, it didn't last very long, as far as I can remember, but I, but I definitely remember that show. Um, I've actually gone for somebody that you discarded as being oh. as being two two thousands. I have gone for Trisha Goddard. Okay. Um, so. When I think of school holidays in the late 90s, uh, I think of bacon sandwiches, uh, which was normally my my lunch of choice at my nan's house where I was staying. Um, and I think of TV programmes like Win, Lose or Draw, which I used to watch. And I think of, of Trisha, who was the uh, 9.25 a.m. Uh, ITV chat show uh, during, the, during the holidays, during the school holidays. And, and I ended up I used to watch a lot of it. I don't know if my nan had it on, just had it on anyway. But um, but I used to watch a lot of Trisha, um, and she really became a sign that I was on. I was on school holiday. Was I would hear the uh, hear the Trisha theme tune. Hey. I remember it being quite an upbeat theme tune for for a TV program which actually dealt with some quite um, severe and serious issues. I also remember uh, there was a period where I was obsessed with, I had like a cassette recorder, a, a small cassette recorder with an inbuilt microphone. Um, and I used to go around like recording different things and recording people's voices. And, and one of my big wishes is that I still had some of those cassette tapes now because I would love to hear, you know, my friend's voice, my family's voices, my own voice from from the early 90s and from from the late 90s and, and the early 2000s when I used to go around and, and record a load of stuff but I also used to record snippets of things off the TV I would just hold it up to the speaker of the TV and record whatever was on and I remember I had a lot of snippets of Trisha uh, on, on on my tapes um, along along with all the voices and, and everything else so so I'm going to go for Trisha as my most 90s uh, chat show it did start in 1998 she defected to uh, Channel 5 in around 2004 I think um, but for those two years at the end of the 90s, she was a big part of my of my school holiday life. Um, didn't pay an awful lot of attention to the actual content uh, the, of the show. But I have to say that, uh, that Trisha is my most 90s chat show host for that reason. OK, great. That's that's a good choice. I, I think as soon as you said 920, that triggered something in my mind. And I think actually I probably did watch quite a lot of it, like you say, in the school holidays, because that would have been right about the time I was eating breakfast or just finished eating breakfast. So. I probably saw quite a lot of it, um, so it's a good choice. Yeah, I, I'm between those two. I'm happy to have in the the ledger. When did nine twenty five cease to be an important television time? Yeah, because I'm sure that was when SMTV Live used to start, or whatever the Saturday morning kids yeah. TV strand was, would always be at nine twenty five. I don't know if Live and Kicking was the same, uh, or or going live. Uh, for it because I, I wasn't much of a, a BBC TV kids TV person as we've already discussed at length um, but 9.25 yeah on a weekend it was the it was SMTV and then on a weekday it was Trisha or Win, Lose or Draw or whatever uh, whatever show would come after the breakfast TV um, mm. yeah bring back 9.25 I say yeah absolutely bring it back yeah. as a as an important time for, for for broadcasts we should change the release time of this podcast to 9.25am on Thursday. <laughs> yeah, we That's should. what we should do. Yeah, I, I'm up for that. Um, please write in and let us know what your favourite 9.25am TV programme was. Please mm -hmm. do. We would love to hear from you on that. What are we putting in the ledger? Sorry, I missed that. Well, I don't want to put any... I don't have any record of Robert Kilroy Silk <laughs> uh, in any of our paperwork. So can we just have Trisha? Of course we can. OK, you're in, Trisha. Kilroy has been shafted. Time now to get into the main topic of the show, and that is, of course, the first two seasons of The Simpsons. Uh, and we have a special guest joining us today for this chat. He is the bass player for Tom O'Dell and the Lieber Street Band. He's an alumni of Corsham School, same as me and Stu. Uh, and, of course, he is a fellow aficionado of The Simpsons, uh, and as far as Stu tells me, uh, he's a thoroughly good egg. It is Max Goff. Hi, Max. Hello. How you doing? Yeah, not bad, thanks. How are you? Very all right. Yeah, yeah, good. Nice to see you guys. And Hi, mate. Thanks for on such a, an important topic. You know, yeah, it doesn't come it much bigger 
doesn't come much bigger than our beloved Simpsons. This is, of course, Stu, our second Simpsons foray after I think it was the second episode, second or third. We did it very early on, yes. So it's yeah. well worth well worth another look. Oh, and yeah. obviously, with, with Max Long to help us out, I think we can we can do things in greater depth and detail this time. Uh, should just say um, uh, to add to Max's list of credits that you gave him there in the intro. <laughs> um, best known for his work with bands such as Sweden and Brazil, Monosaccharides, and Munchie and the Mangoes. Uh, just Fantastic. thought I'd add those to the list. Those things I'd sort of hoped had been confined to the annals of history. There's always one person that remembers every band <laughs> I've ever been in. <laughs> and Corinthian and Casuals, which is nice. Yeah. What kind that's, of that's well, let's, not, let's not mention then. What kind oh, of band? Would, what kind of uh, friend would I be if I didn't rem- remember your entire roll call of, uh, of of associated acts? Jesus Christ! <laughs> it's, amazing. it's not worth it. All right, let's talk oh, about much this. more embarrassing bands. Yeah, Carol. <laughs> what did you guys cover before then? What's what other Simpsons things have you been through already? Well, we did the we basically did the, all of the '90s episodes of The Simpsons. So I think that was up to so series well from the start of The Simpsons up until series what is that nine or ten? Yes, yeah, yeah, or eleven. Yeah, so, oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we picked our our top three from the entirety of the '90s run. Um, which obviously gave us a, wow. a, a broad scope. Um, so we've decided to look at things a bit more in depth this time and uh, and, and take yeah. it two seasons at a time so that we can look at some, uh, you know, look at them in a bit more depth and detail. Yeah, just yeah. so you can watch every single episode all over again. Exactly, yeah. Any excuse, <laughs> any excuse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as Stu says, yeah, we did our top threes of the whole of the first 10 or 11 series before... We're going to do a similar thing now where we each pick three of our favourite episodes from those first two series. Um, shall we start with you, Stu, with your first choice? Yes, absolutely. Um, I will talk about this one first because it is one that I covered uh, in the back in the first episode. Uh, and if I didn't nominate it as my favourite Simpsons episode of all time, I should have done. It, it's up there with Homer at the Bat from season three. Um, but this is Lisa's Substitute from season two. Uh, I think I, I think ooh, I spoke about this yeah. in the first episode. I mean, you did. Okay. Yeah. Well, I knew I knew at least one of us would have done. Yeah, um, I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but this is fun. this is really up there um, as as one of my my favourites of the entire series. It's one of the ones again with Homer at the bat. It's one of the ones where if I see it's uh, coming on the TV, I will have to sit down and watch it. Um, I can't I can't yeah. turn up an opportunity um, to miss the episode. I just think the main plot and the subplot. Are both brilliant. So obviously the main plot is that uh, uh, Mr. Bergstrom is is covering for Miss Hoover in, in Lisa's class, and Lisa becomes uh, rather smitten with him and ends up obviously yep. needing to to go and help some other children in a different in a different town and and having to leave Lisa, but, but giving her some wonderful life advice uh, as he leaves on the train. Um, and the subplot with the uh, election in Bart's class, where he goes up against Martin Prince as the uh, to be elected as a class president, is also. Oh, yeah. Absolutely brilliant. It's one of those things where you, you don't remember that they're necessarily both in the same episode. They could almost be episodes yeah. of their own. Um, but it just speaks to the such high standard of the show by that point that they were able to to marry these things up into one episode and have them both going on at the same time. Amazing. And yeah. then the way that uh, Homer brings it together at the end and, and makes good with Lisa, cheers Bart up after losing the election, and then just um, stopping Maggie from from waking up and crying as he, as he leaves her bedroom at the end is um, oh, is a really yeah. sweet ending as well. So I really, really love this episode. Speaking of Homer, I think it might be the first time where we really see him sort of as a, as a bit of an oaf um, and, and saying to Lisa, just because I doesn't care, I don't care, it doesn't mean I don't understand, um, is, is one of the lines when, when yeah, Lisa's yeah. trying to explain why she's so upset. And I just think it's um, it's definitely... The best episode of season two for me, and and, and one of my favourite episodes of the entire nineties run. Absolutely, oh, man. Yeah. it's so good. I haven't seen that one for a little while. When I was sort of trying to figure out how to research and do my little bit of prep for this podcast, I was trying to sort of figure out which ones I needed to watch, and that one I just sort of glazed over it, just because I, I I don't remember. It's one of those ones I don't remember until you know you give me that synopsis, and suddenly it's like, oh, this is amazing. There's something I like about the um, the guest stars they have in that series are incredible. Like it's proper Hollywood A-listers. It's not sort of it's not too like American centric. So it's like it's people that everyone knows. And I think one of my episodes 
or go into it's got another extremely heavyweight guest star in. and for ages i don't think i realized that that was um dustin hoffman in it not i wasn't it, i think when i first saw it i wouldn't have picked up on that at all mm-hmm. it's only it's sort just... of in my adult life and after i watched like the graduate suddenly you get all these references that are coming out in there the, yeah because um, he's uncredited yeah. isn't he i think am i right he's, a, he's, oh. he's in there as a i think he's in there as a pseudonym i think the pseudonym is sam etic which is obviously yeah. a, a play on words of semitic yeah um yeah Yes, yeah, so there's there's a, a clear um, graduate reference with Mrs. Krabappel trying her best to yeah. s- Mr. Bergstrom, um, <laughs> as you good. say. And it's, uh, as as these you know these references become clear when you get older and you end up watching the, the source material that the writers have used in order to in order to construct the episodes. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that was a pretty big omission I made when I began talking about the episode. Was that I didn't mention that Dustin Hoffman obviously uh, lends his voice to Mr. Bergstrom. But yeah, just just an excellent, excellent episode, and and I love it every time. Yeah, definitely yeah. one of my favourites. As 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 I showed by choosing it in that previous episode, it's it's in my top three of all time for, for sure. So glad glad you chose it again, and we got another chance to to remind everyone how good it is. Because, I'm always yeah. happy to talk about it. Always. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love. Bit, I remember um, when in the election sort of the subplot in there. With Barton, he's sort of campaigning and doing the um, debates with Martin. And the thing I didn't get the first time around that I was sort of picked up on before is the um, when Martin's trying to campaign against getting rid of asbestos. And Bart's like, going, more asbestos, more asbestos. <laughs> I didn't pick up on that the first time. It was amazing. I was just like, <laughs> yeah, I think something at the age of about four or five I wouldn't have got. But yeah. Well, there's a very, there's a good joke in there as well at the end when. Um... Martin wins the election and he, he holds up a, a newspaper which says Simpson defeats Prince. And that's actually that actually happened in an American election in the, the 20s or 30s. There was a, a newspaper that went to print too soon and predicted that the other candidate would win. And then uh, he, the, the guy who did win was then pictured holding the paper saying that the other person had won. Um, yeah. so, so that's that's another another American politics that's, reference. But. That's great. Yeah, that's great. In a sample taken in this very classroom, a state inspector found 1.74 parts per million of asbestos. That's not enough. We demand more asbestos. More asbestos. More asbestos. More asbestos. More asbestos. So my first episode is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? from season two, which is, I watched it this morning because, you know, I'm self-employed. Um, <laughs> so... Um, this one is uh, the start of it. There's no, there's only one plot in this. I sort of hadn't really thought about it, but it's one of the rare episodes like Homer at the Bat, I think, that only has one sort of direct thing. I think probably because all the family are kind of involved in this one sort of shift of a, a plot line. Um, so at the start, um, it begins with Grandpa and Jasper in the cinema. So the they watch the McBain film. They they're obviously complaining about it. And then they're complaining to the cinema manager afterwards and grandpa has a heart attack uh, with a phone call from the hospital say that he's had a heart attack they all have to go in and then grandpa tells homer that he has a long lost brother after a dalliance with someone from the lo- from the uh, traveling carnival so then uh, searches through all the directories and chases up the um the orphanage and then eventually finds that finds out that his brother Herbert Powell, uh, voiced by Danny DeVito, is a multimillionaire sort of car manufacturing tycoon based in Detroit, I believe. Um, but yeah, so that's the the general opening plot gambit. I, I don't know why I like the episode so much because obviously there's like there's funny bits of it, but I think it's just the fact that it's such it's such a no, it's obviously a very sweet kind of a, a sweet sort of plot line to it but i think it's just the fact that his character is so well done and he's kind of the opposite of homer it's just the fact that it's kind of the, the whole episode is this kind of immersive world like in the same way that homer at the bat is kind of the whole episode is just center of, centered around this one thing yeah so the whole thing's just taken up with this kind of very glamorous yeah yeah there's no, there's no setting at all yeah no i mean so I had this uh, down as one of mine as well. Um, oh, is so, it? So okay. clearly, we're, clearly we're in sync here as, as Simpsons fans, mate, so that, that's yeah. good to know. Um, 
I've got my favourite line down. It's when Herb is trying to encourage Homer to stamp his authority on the team when uh, when he's designing his car. <laughs> yeah. And Homer calls Herb Unky Herb, um, which, I, which I've always found hilarious. <laughs> oh, oh, Unky Herb, I, I know. noticed that. Um, but what does <laughs> jar with me slightly, although I, I do love the episode, and yeah. the follow-up episode, which I'm sure we'll talk about uh, when the time comes, mm-hmm. is also superb. Yeah. Um, but what jars with me is that... Uh, Herb obviously loses his his uh, company and his fortune because of the money that he's invested in the car designed by Homer. And yeah. then at the end of the episode, proceeds to blame Homer for everything. But he yeah. was the one who ordered Homer to do it and got him involved. Mm. And I always yeah, feel a bit... The company, the company was going under anyway. Yeah. So I always feel a bit righteous on, on Homer's part at the end when, when, when Herb's having a go at him because it's not Homer's fault. He's only, he's only done what he's been told to do. Um, yeah. And he was given carte blanche by Herb. So, yeah, and he was quite insistent that he didn't know how to design a car or do anything. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. I love the the design of the car and everything. I like when he's Herb's doing the kind of big press conference reveal thing, and he's you know thanking members of the press for being there and um, whoever the hell like celebrities and all that. And then he says, "Your Holiness," and then this kind of post <laughs> hat just comes into view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's amazing. It's so good. Um, <laughs> There's the bit at the start when um, Homer's introducing Herb to all to his family, and Herb says, "You're the richest man I know." And Homer just says, "I feel the same way about you." <laughs> so I really just really like they're not jokes, but they're just really stupid things mm-hmm. to say. And it's, yeah, I really like all yeah. that. Um, One of my absolute yeah. favorite parts of the episode is um, Homer's trip to Shelbyville Orphanage. Oh yeah, <laughs> and the, the the orphanage owner is uh, is Doctor J- Doctor Hibbert's long lost brother. Yeah, um, and uh, <laughs> Homer just doesn't realise. Even yeah. though the guy's yeah. saying I had a long lost brother, um, and the whole thing when they're trying to steer him towards uh, Detroit as well is um, yes, the, is, the, the is, city of brotherly love is <laughs> is Detroit, um, just packed with so many so many great lines, and and the yeah. series is really hitting its stride. By this point, as yeah. you say, is you know another another great guest star in in Danny DeVito as Herb as well, yeah, um, and, uh, and and another one in in that pantheon of greats that joined in in with the second season, yeah. yeah. And there's a there's a really nice classic one of those classic ending moments of, of sort of touching uh, pathos when uh, Bart says to Homer that he he liked a car. He liked yeah. the way the car looks, and Homer's yeah. like, "Yeah, thanks, son." And it's kind of just a nice bit of um, redemption for Homer, and a nice Simpsons yeah. ending moment that I really yeah. like. Very nice. God, that new baby smell. Homer, you're the richest man I know. I feel the same about you. I'll I'll go on to my choice if that's okay, because it. it sort of follows on a little bit from what I just said there about the the pathos of that that little moment at the end of that episode. Mm-hmm. which I really like, because that is something that I do really like about The Simpsons. And it's another reason why I love the Lisa's Substitute episode, because I yeah. do like pathos and melancholy in, in comedy series in general, but especially in The Simpsons, because it is, of course, the, the greatest comedy program of the 90s and maybe of all time. So the episode I've gone for is Moaning Lisa from season one, episode six. So it's a really early one. Um, and this is the one where it, it's not a big sort of high concept storyline by any means it's just lisa wakes up one morning feeling very sad and she doesn't really know why um she goes to school and sort of all these things keep happening to her that just compound her her mood so she gets chastised by the music teacher for improvising on the saxophone i think she gets pounded in um dodgeball when they're playing playing that at, at, at pe um and it's she's sort of she's going through this mood she doesn't really know why and then eventually um, she hears this music coming, sort of drifting down the street uh, and it, she follows the sound and it uh, ends up being Bleeding Gums Murphy making his first ever appearance in The Simpsons. And then they have this conversation and he says, you know, if you're feeling sad, it, I think he probably refers to it as a blues. And he says, you know, you should get this, get this feeling out in your music. And so that really lightens Lisa's mood. But then there's also this bit with where Marge is telling her trying to give her some advice and saying, you know, just put a brave face on. That's what everyone wants. And so you should just smile through the sadness. And then eventually something happens at school where Lisa is is sort of told that 
and then Marge has this change of mind and she says no you know what you should be honest about your feelings I don't want you to try and cover up your feelings you should be honest and then that sort of ends up leading to Lisa's mood lifting and and, and creating this sort of happy ending and then there's also a B storyline where Homer and Bart are battling each other on this fighting game uh, on their computer. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A very yeah. blocky early version of, or replication of something like Street Fighter um, with two boxes that look strikingly similar to Homer and Bart themselves, which yeah. is quite a nice touch. <laughs> um, so that so that B storyline is like the, the light relief for the more sad uh, and maudlin A storyline with Lisa. Um, and yeah, the reason I've chosen it is, is like I said, I, I do really like the the touching and melancholy episodes of The Simpsons. Uh, I really like the message of it that it sort of yeah. comes across with with the way Marge eventually tells Lisa, you know, you should be yourself, and also with Bleeding Gum saying, you know, don't, you can embrace it, you can just put it into your music and, and make something good come out of it. Um, and it's also the first episode where Lisa is the main character, and she yeah. is one of my favourite characters of The Simpsons as a whole. I really like her her story arcs and her episodes. So it was nice to have a, an episode devoted to her in this first series. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I've chosen it. It's, it's for that pathos and that, that bittersweet Simpsons magic. Do I find you... it interesting that Lisa's your favourite character. I've never... One I've of not them, yeah. Yeah. Only because, like, the thing I noticed with Lisa is because she's the only character where if something changes with her, it sort of sticks and it has permanence that carries through. So mm-hmm. like the fact that she got into jazz in that episode is a thing that's just gone through the, the whole series of everything. And yeah. when she stops eating meat, there's a notable change of when she stops doing that, when she becomes a Buddhist later on, there's a thing yeah, that carries, carries through, whereas all the rest of it kind of resets and everyone sort of stays the same. She seems to be the only character that grows and changes. I just yeah. figured that out right now. I've not no, noticed that's a really that before. Good <laughs> that's yeah. a... I'd not incisive, that. Uh, incisive journalism there. That's, that's super. It <laughs> <laughs> added something worthwhile to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah she... again, it's not it's not an episode that I really remember that much until it happens. I remember, I've sort of got very early memories of it, like literally, you know, from being a child and watching it, hmm. and it doesn't feel like it's got like a big dramatic storyline, but it's very sort of significant and really sweet. I really like that. Um, yeah. It's definitely yeah, not it's one of the, it's not one of the sort of most remembered episodes. It's not one of the big ones. It's not yes. that highly regarded in, in the, in the charts and, and later reviews just reading up about it in preparation for this episode. And it doesn't seem to be that highly yeah. regarded, but, I, I mean, it is low key. It definitely is low key, and that's I think one of the reasons why I like yeah. it because it is a bit more of a human human story. Yeah, I, I do enjoy the payoff at the end of uh, of the whole family going to the jazz hall to see Bleeding Gums perform, and then him performing Lisa's song yeah. about about the family, um, yeah. and then realizing it as the lyrics are being performed that it's about them. <laughs> that's yeah. a, that is a great payoff. Um, yeah, and yeah, no, so as, as you say, Max, it's it's Lisa, it's Lisa becoming. Um, uh, you know, becoming a jazz fan as well, which is which is an important thing for the series going yeah. forward. Um, so yeah, an, an important episode in that respect, and uh, it's it's good that we yeah. we are going to get some season one love on this episode because I was a bit worried it would be season two dominated. But um, yeah, no excellent choice, Alex. Yeah, I, yeah, definitely could have done three episodes just from season two. Or yeah, mm-hmm. but, yeah, yeah. But it's amazing. It's good. It's great that um, sort of forget with such a long running series that in how much they had to sort of set up in the first series. Like with, you know, all these different like personality traits, they have to sort of establish it really well. And just going through the episodes, you sort of realise like, like how much you have to learn and retain about all these different characters. You know, it's an interesting thing. It's mm-hmm. sort of what makes the first season more important than it is, you know, as sort of accomplished and established as the season two and later episodes become. Lisa, I apologize to you. I was wrong. I take it all back. Always be yourself. You want to be sad, honey? Be sad. We'll write it out with you. And when you get finished feeling sad, we'll still be there. From now on, let me do the smiling for both of us. Okay, Mom. I said you could stop smiling, Lisa. I feel like smiling. So, Stu, your second choice has sort of already been covered. Is that right by by Max's first choice? That's right, yes. Um, and I'm more than happy to uh, allow Max the pleasure of, of talking about 
uh, my other choice as well. Um, so so feel free to skip over me and, and go straight on to the big man. Oh, God. Okay, yeah. Let's go, Max. Sure. What, what's uh, your... I don't want to deprive you. So my second choice and Stu's first choice uh, is Simpson and Delilah. Um, so the family are watching a... Uh, they're having TV dinners and watching a quiz show and shouting That's answers it. at the TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the advert for yeah. Demoxenil comes on the TV and Homer's immediately entranced and, and we go from there. It's again, yeah. it's straight in. There's within about thirty seconds, literally, you are into the main plot. There's no, uh, there's no flannel at all. It's it's ten, you know, ten yeah. seconds and in. But that's what I mean about all these. Every good episode kind of starts with something that has nothing to do with the main plot, really. But like you just remember this kind of generic family moment of you know watching a quiz show and everyone screaming at the telly and getting the answers wrong. And <laughs> I, think, I can't remember what it is that Homer gets wrong, but he says about. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, as, a, as a very short synopsis sorry what are you going to say the capital of North Dakota is named after which world leader oh, okay the capital of North Dakota is named after what German ruler Hitler Hitler North Dakota Bismarck Bismarck oh. yeah. hey I'm still beating you boy <laughs> <laughs> that's so good um, uh, so yeah, yeah so then, it's uh, the episode where Homer gets hair which is mm -hmm. amazing and then gets a um an executive job at the plant. I suppose it could be argued that the subplot is the uh, addition of of Carl as his secretary, yes. who obviously comes in comes in to help him. I think this is another episode which really doesn't have a subplot as such, um, but but Carl is a is a big player. So so as you say, um, Homer then then gets a, a healthy main affair after having charged the plant's medical uh, medical fund the thousand dollars it costs for the treatment yes and begins begins working his way up through the ranks uh rises to junior executive and gets given the executive washroom key as you say max bart then has a mishap with the with the demoxnil when he's trying to apply it to himself in order to grow a goatee and yep. uh, and and the it gets spilt and, and he can't use it anymore loses all his hair and then um returns to his former job after mr burns takes pity on him as a fellow uh, a fellow bald man um, but this is yeah. such such a great episode. And one thing I'll say on this is that um, I, when I started my first full time job, which was which was an IT, IT job at the secondary school, the computer that I inherited from the previous incumbent of the job had the first six episodes of season two of The Simpsons on the hard drive. And he obviously wow. just left them there. Uh, whoever had had it before me had put them on there and left them there. So I watched those episodes a lot in sort of slow times when, uh, <laughs> when, when there wasn't, you know, when there wasn't a lot going on. And Simpson and Delilah was one of the episodes that I watched a lot. Um, and that's why I've that's why I've come to appreciate it so much, really. It's a it's a good memory of, of my first steps into the working world. Uh, my favorite line yeah. is when Mr. Burns invites Homer <laughs> to guess his age. Homer says, I don't know, 102. <laughs> and Mr. Burns says, yeah. I'm only 81. <laughs> that's amazing I love that I think one of my favourite lines is when they just before they give Homer the key they go and find him in the bathroom stall they say Mr Simpson don't sit on that filthy thing a moment longer you can just see his little feet underneath the door <laughs> it's amazing I love that <laughs> um, I think it's quite a rare episode quite a rare example of Homer showing some sort of vulnerability isn't it in the fact that he obviously really yeah. cares about being bald and it gives him all this this self esteem when he gets to hair, and it's sort of something you don't see a lot of in The Simpsons. I don't think Homer showing that sort of vulnerable side and and having yeah. this awareness of his body um, and sort of shame about that. So that's kind of an interesting element. I think something that gives it a nice human touch as well, which I think yeah, you get more yeah. of in these early episodes than you do later on. Mm -hmm. So that's another yeah. reason why and through the whole episode as well, he's just kind of got this imposter syndrome. Because he's you know, obviously he's not supposed to have hair and he's not supposed to have this huge job and he, like you say you can just see this insecurity going through the whole thing. I always thought that Carl must have been voiced by someone significant, but I don't. I remember looking at her before. I don't think it was anyone. She's got a hell of a voice. Yes, it's, it's Harvey Firestein, um, who oh. I, I also okay. know from guesting in an episode of Cheers, which I'm also a massive fan of. Um, Is it, but I'm, I'm not. Right? A, I'm not a massive. Um, uh, I haven't followed his work apart from obviously being Carl mainly. Um, but yeah, that, that is the voice of, yeah, of the yeah. actor Harvey Firestein. Just going off his voice, I think Amazing. he's in Independence Day as well. 
I think he is someone oh, who right. gets blown up in his car. I'm going to look it up now. <laughs> well, while you do that, um, I will if have that's to say... right, that's amazing knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise until today that Demoxanil is a parody of a real product called Minoxidil. Is it? Oh, yeah, is it? That's and cool. min- Minoxidil is a hair regrowth treatment that's available in the US. Um, and <laughs> right. they, they've literally just switched the wow. M and the D around to make Demoxidil. Um, so absolutely superb. I had no idea until until That's research so good. earlier on today. That is cool. The yeah, other thing Harvey... I love about this episode is how. Oh, sorry, Karen. I was just going to say how the Fierstein Firestein is in Independence Day. So there you go. I feel vindicated. Wow, well done. <laughs> Excellent. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry. What were you going to say? Um, I was going to say the other thing I really love about this episode how is how pretty much every scene home has got a different hairstyle. Like it's it's not mm-hmm. even as yeah, if yeah. they're just keeping him one thing. It's like just getting more and more refined, and you know he's got the big sort of seventies yeah. quiff, and then he's you know just got a, like a, a real nineteen eighties kind of slick back brill cream kind of look, and yeah, so it's, it's like nice detail in that. Mister Simpson, don't sit on that filthy thing one second longer. They've given you the key. <gasps> the key. Okay, so my second choice is another Series 1 episode then. So I, I think I'm representing Series 1 a little bit more than either of you. But this is The Call of the Simpsons, uh, Episode 7 mm. of Series 1. And this is the episode where Homer decides to buy a motorhome uh, because he's jealous of, of Flanders' new RV. And the yeah. Simpsons go on, on a camping trip to the wilds of uh, whichever area of the US they live in. Uh, and they end up the RV ends up going over a cliff basically because they get lost uh, and so it leaves the Simpsons lost in the wild Homer and Bart decide to go and get help while Lisa, Marge and Maggie stay behind, although Maggie doesn't get left behind because there's some confusion over who is looking after her so she ends up separated and then getting adopted by a family of bears, which is I suppose like the B storyline Yeah, but it's um, it's just one of those early Simpsons episodes. It's very, very simple, like the ones we talked about, really. It's been, it's mainly one storyline. It's not high concept. There's no ridiculous celebrity cameos or anything. It's just a simple story. No. The Simpsons get lost in the woods. Uh, and it just, as a result, leads to some of, I think, the best gags and some of the best visual gags in the Simpsons uh, history. So some of the, the classic gags I, I've picked out are Homer's rabbit trap, where he's, he's showing Bart how to set a trap for a rabbit. Um, yeah. And obviously flings it into the, <laughs> onto the horizon. Um, there's Homer being described by... Oh, because at the end, when Homer does reach civilization, he, because of things that have happened to him, he gets mistaken as Bigfoot by a member of the public yeah. and gets captured by scientists. <laughs> uh, and one of the scientists uh, describes Homer as being either a below average human being or a brilliant beast, which I think is really funny. <laughs> um, and then they're interviewing, I think Marge gets like intervenes and says, you know, that's my husband. And then it flashes up this headline saying, I married Bigfoot, which I think is a, another <laughs> great visual gag. Um, and it, that's just, yeah, three, three out of many in this episode, which I think really just make it easy to rewatch because it's such a yeah. simple, visual, funny episode. And um, yeah, that's why I've chosen it. That's so good. Yeah, man. Yeah. Two of my favourite uh, moments there are Homer referring to himself and being referred to as an experienced woodsman, which always yes. makes me laugh. I don't know why. <laughs> and um, and quite near the start, actually, when, when they're buying the RV, um, what's the guy? Is it Honest Bob or Happy uh, Bob or something like that? I, I can't remember that, yeah. what the salesman's called. <laughs> yeah. um, but his, his credit alarm on his computer goes off when he runs Homer's details through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Homer yeah. says it's that good. <laughs> that Cowboy Bob character is Cowboy Bob. Sorry, is the name of the Cowboy, Cowboy, Cowboy Bob. Of course, yeah. I do apologise, everyone. He's voiced by uh, Albert Brooks um, as a sort of, I think maybe uncredited cameo. I don't actually know who Albert Brooks is. I think he's. Uh, it's probably embarrassing to say that. Yeah, one of the best single episode characters, probably isn't he? Cowboy Bob, I think. Yeah, I think if I'm not wrong, he also does the voice for uh, Jacques, the bowling instructor. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Later on, later on in the season, I think that's Albert Brooks as well. How do you remember these things? <laughs> uh, I'm never going to have any sort of career, but I can remember this. <laughs> that'll do. 
There you go. It's a trade-off. I'm not going to quote your price till I check your credit rating. And let me, I want to make myself clear on this. This is a formality. If you're saying to me, Bob, is this guy good for it? I say, yes. I don't check this machine. But I don't own the place, even though my name's up there. Long story, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to have to run it through the computer. Is, is that a good siren? Am I approved? You ever known a siren to be good? <laughs> No, Mr. Simpson, it's not. It's a bad siren. Right, Max, what about your third choice? My third choice, I was very determined to get something from season one, just so I wasn't okay, good. Sort of favouring too, too much. So my third one is Krusty Gets Busted. Just because I love Sideshow Bob, that character, and I like the, the fact that that's where it all started. And But yeah, the synopsis is uh, Homer has to go to the Quickie Mart to buy ice cream because... Patty and Selma are coming round for uh, to show their holiday slides. I can't remember where they've been. Uh, the Yucatan. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I remember these things. I am. Um, I'm shot away. <laughs> so Homer has to go. Homer goes to the Quickie Mart and buys ice cream, premium ice cream, and they have chocolate, double chocolate, or triple chocolate. <laughs> While he's in there, the uh, supposedly Krusty the Clown comes in and holds up the Quickie Mart, robs it, and uh, Krusty is then arrested and Bart and Lisa take it on themselves to prove his innocence. And it turns out to be his uh, long-suffering sidekick, Sideshow Bob, voiced by, obviously, Kelsey Grammer and a much recurring guest star throughout this, the franchise, I suppose, but... I think any episode that's very crusty heavy is really good. I think he's a very sort of brash character that just, I can't, I, I wish I'd written down some lines. I only thought to do that for one of these episodes, but um, yeah, I love everything he does. There's no, a later episode where he has to sing the national anthem. And it's just oh, yeah. one of the funniest things because every line he delivers is him just screaming. He never says anything at a normal volume. Everything is just ridiculous. Um and yeah, I, I think Sideshow Bob's a great character. That is a great episode. I think it's one of the sort of iconic episodes of the early series, isn't it? The, this yeah. investigation episode. I, I always forget how early it is that Sideshow Bob stops being Krusty's Sideshow character. Because I'm assuming yeah. Mel comes in pretty much straight after this. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he's not really Sideshow Bob for, for very long at all, is he? He, he straight away no. becomes that criminal character well he's sort of in a couple of earlier episodes but i think he had blue or green hair didn't he it was it sort of they didn't really work out what he was going to look like yeah yeah no i think you're yeah, right like yeah and there's a there's few, a few characters there's a few, like that aren't there yeah like smithers yeah he was he was off black, black wasn't it first yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and then you learn you know you learn a lot about crusty in the in this episode as well the fact that he yes the fact that he can't read does, does, does that carry on or was that just a device for the one episode um, and then the, obviously the kids use that to realise that, well, whoever was in the Quickie Mart was reading the newspaper and Krusty can't read. So They uh, do go back to it in a later episode when Bart writes him a letter and Krusty's trying to read it and he can't even read his own name because he pronounces it Crust Y or something. So there's, <laughs> a, there's, there's a few other references where he, he definitely can't read. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously the, yeah. the, the payoff where they Bart realises that it must have been Sideshow Bob because of the, the size of his feet yeah. and, uh, yes. and the fact that somebody stood on them and he was hopping around yeah. with his with his massive foot. Um, yeah, yeah. I thought was yeah, was 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 quite a clever way to um to wrap things up really. Um yeah. and yeah, there's, there's the first crusty focused episode and it, and introducing the character. Incidentally, did you know that the the intention with Krusty was going to be that he was going to look a lot like Homer, or probably a lot more like Homer than he does. And yeah. the the joke was going to be that Bart hero worshipped somebody who like was pretty much a dead ringer for his own dad, but then uh, you know disliked his own disliked his dad and didn't didn't regard his dad as such. Um, but but then oh, hero wow. worshipped Krusty. So and then that that idea was dropped. Um, I think a bit later on, uh, and obviously then used again to good effect when Homer becomes a, a Krusty the Clown impersonator yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. In, in a few seasons time um, but yeah i think that was the intention with the crusty character was just to to be, be a little joke yeah that's really interesting yeah because yeah they definitely do look almost exactly the same don't they 
Mm-hmm. I like their sort of Easter eggs, so things that were planned and changed or things that never really went anywhere, but there's some residual element that you can still see. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. cool. So what's on your mind, Bart? I bet the other children don't accept you. True side show, Bob, but that doesn't bother me. You see, my sisters and I have been doing a little investigating, and it looks to us like Krusty was framed. I will go on to my third choice, and I think this is the final choice of, of the episode of the pod episode, I should say. And it is series two, episode one, Bart gets an F. So now apparently this is the highest rating episode of the show ever. Um, I think this is by the Nielsen Nielsen ratings or something that they have in America. Mm -hmm. And it was the highest rating, highest rated Fox show for a few years and the most watched Fox show for some years. So it's a big one. And this is the episode where Bart is basically failing his classes uh, and he's getting threatened with having to retake the the year, not graduating his year and having to retake it, which is something we don't get in the UK, is it? The idea of not passing yeah. a grade and then having to do it again mm-hmm. is quite, it's a very yeah. American thing or North American thing. So that's what's happening to Bart. And he, he he's under all this pressure. And then he gets this opportunity, basically, to take this last exam. That is, if he passes it, he will be able to move on to the next grade. And if he doesn't, and have to stay stay back. He keeps getting all this temptation to to not study. There's one, I think the the main one is when it's a snow day, and it's like this great reprieve because he doesn't have the exam that day, and he wants to go out and play. But then, he convinces himself to to stay and study, and then he takes the exam, and he still fails it. But then there's this moment where he's sort of lamenting the fact that he's going to uh, have to go back a year, and it doesn't seem fair. And he during the course of that lament to Mrs. Crabapple, he he references some George Washington defeat, I think, in some battle. Uh, and yeah. the teacher is, is impressed that he's got this knowledge, even though it's not relevant to the exam, but it just shows some sort of independent thought and, and study. So she gives him an extra grave and he passes and it's it's a happy ending. He runs home and um, it's a really nice ending to the episode where the whole family gathers around and he like puts his exam with the grade on the fridge and everyone stands around and sort of admires it and it's this sort of happy ending and it's i think it's a i think it's one of the episodes where there's only one storyline it's not lots going yeah. on just as a really simple a to b story and yeah i just really like it and i did find this kind of quite interesting um quote from one of the creators because uh, apparently after series one the simpsons simpsons have been getting quite a lot of criticism for especially bart being like a bad role model because he's obviously a, a naughty student and and doesn't achieve very highly at school. Um, so yeah. people were saying, is this episode a response to that? And then James L. Brooks, who's one of the producers, said um, that this episode wasn't in response to that. And he said, uh, we're mindful of those criticisms, but I do think it's important for us that Bart does badly in school because there are students like that. And besides, I'm very wary of television where everybody is supposed to be a role model. You don't run across that many role models in real life. So why should television be full of them? Um, so I quite like that sort of rebellious streak from the Simpsons creators. They're saying, you know, no, we're going to stick with this. We're not going to listen to the criticism and make him like a goody two shoes or, or make or change the character. It's important that we show people like this on TV. And I do really like that rebellious streak of the Simpsons. You know, there's that really iconic moment where they're watching the TV and it's uh, George Bush is on TV mm-hmm. and saying, imploring the, the US public to be, I think it's more like the Waltons, is it? And less like the Simpsons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that they obviously just mock that. And I, I just love that element of the Simpsons. It's one of the many things I love about the show. So that's why I've chosen it really. I think it's a, it's a good episode. It's a, it's a sweet storyline and yeah, the sort of start of that rebellious streak of, of the program, I think. Yeah, I love that episode. It, I, I like how much happens in it as well. I, I, there's the whole bit where he gets Martin to tutor him, mm, but then yeah, Martin yeah. sort of gets drawn into the dark side, and you know, yeah, it ends up walking out of the exam at the end wearing a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Later, Mrs. K, and then just sort of strolls up. It's amazing. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> um, I do enjoy the dream sequence yeah. where he, where uh, Bart's been obviously been studying or he's not dreaming but he's imagining you know trying to get in there mm. and then uh because oh, yeah. he's studying on the snow day and then the what he's imagining <laughs> happening in 1776 they have a snow day then as yeah. well 
and uh, John Hancock writes his name in the snow, which always makes yeah, me so always makes me laugh. Right. <laughs> um, so this this is another one, obviously, because it's episode one of the season. This is another one that was on that computer of that first six episodes that I had. I've watched this one numerous amounts of times as well. Um, and yeah, no, and I'm not really surprised to hear that it's the highest rated episode of all time because obviously the first season was was quite a success and it was becoming well becoming one of the biggest shows on american television so to, to have a sort of what's the story morning glory effect for the for the second season with everybody wanting to know what it's like and and making it one of the biggest uh, biggest things of the time uh, it doesn't surprise me at all well of uh, 59 it's a high f who am i kidding i really am a failure <laughs> Oh, oh, now I know how George Washington felt when he surrendered Fort Necessity to the French in 1754. What? Oh, you know, 1754, the famous defeat of the French. Right, so that is our choices. We do have a bit of correspondence here, don't we, Stu, which I'm going to cool. dig yeah. out from the mailbag now. We always want to hear an expert's opinion on whatever topic we're talking about. Um, so for this topic, we contacted... A brilliant podcast called the simpsons episode by episode which you can find on spotify we will put a link in the episode description so you can click on that i've listened to many episodes and it is a brilliant podcast so you should uh, go and listen to them and we asked them what they thought their favorite episodes were or what the best episodes were of the first two series uh, and they have come up with the following here are our top episodes based on our final rankings because they at the end of each episode they they give the episode they're talking about a, a rating mm. uh, and the three top ones from series one and two were treehouse of horror bart the daredevil and oh brother where art thou so one of the ones you talked about there mm -hmm. uh, all three oh, wow. were rated an a scoring between 8.5 and 8.8 .8 in final viewing ratings uh, the reasoning was all three have seeds planted for what makes The Simpsons great between ser series four and 11. Uh, misdirections, solid overall A stories and great pacing. Um, so that was what the episode by episode podcast of The Simpsons uh, guy said. Uh, how do you two feel about those those three? I don't think that can be argued with. I mean, uh, Bart yeah, the Daredevil. Bart the Daredevil. Hmm. Yes, yeah. it actually has one of my favourite, it might be my favourite Simpsons joke of all time. I've probably said that a lot on this episode, but this really is it, <laughs> is when it's just after Homer's interminable fall down the gorge. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they've airlifted him up on the on the gurney into the ambulance, and his head's been knocking on the, on the side <laughs> as they're bringing him up. They load him into the ambulance, the ambulance drives away, immediately crashes into a tree, he comes back out of the back on the stretcher and goes straight back down the cliff again. I think that is wonderful. It's so good. Yeah. I yes. hoot every time I see that. It is an amazing, yeah. amazing gag. And uh, yeah, Treehouse of Horror as well is obviously one of the, you know, it was the first in the in the series of Treehouse of Horror episodes, yeah. which would follow. Um, That's the one with um, James Earl Jones. Doing a voice in it or doing narrating the Raven? Yes. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we did also ask Legend of the Pod Big Tim Parker, who is a massive fan of The Simpsons as well. Uh, yeah. He has not come up with three as yet, but he's given us one to to get us going, and he's chosen The Call of the Simpsons, which is the one I talked about. He says the others will require him to rewatch both seasons in full. Uh, as if he needed an excuse uh, yeah, and I mean, do some serious deliberating and he'll get back to us but mm -hmm. so far we've got one and obviously I agree with, with that episode very much uh, so mm -hmm. Big Tim do get in touch when you finish watching the first two series and tell us what your <laughs> other two choices are because we'd love to hear from you we would also love to hear from anyone else who is listening what are your favourite episodes of these first two series of The Simpsons you can get in touch with us in the usual way using our link tree and you know what? I'm not going to read out what the link is. I'm just going to say, go to the link below yep. in the episode description uh, and find it there and send us an email or find us on Twitter or Instagram. Let us know because, yeah, we want to know what you think. Well, Max, thank you so much for coming along and joining us for this this quick... Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thanks, man. Really appreciate putting it. Putting up with my ramblings about things I can vaguely remember. <laughs> <laughs> No, that, that that basically is is the tagline of this podcast, isn't it? Amazing. <laughs> Rather than about things we can vaguely remember. Yeah, that'll do. Such a just long time ago. <laughs> just before you go, is there anything uh, 
musical local coming up that you'd like to uh, like to tell us about where we can where we can catch you and the boys in the Libra Street Band or, or anything else? Uh, so the Libra Street Band, it depends where you're local to. If you're local to the London area, we're playing at a pub called The Angelic in Islington. And that's just, it's a really nice pub, big open space and everything. And we're just putting on a, our own little gig there, you know, just playing blues a bit too loud but it's a great band um it's me and the other uh, max and toby from tom's touring band and a great keys player called dan bingham who plays with james arthur and the streets and all sorts of people amazing organ player and we just sit there and make a racket for two hours um and i mean i'm going on tour with tom quite soon but that doesn't need my promotion no. <laughs> <laughs> he, he does well on his own that's you know that's fine. but yeah we're going on tour everywhere so yeah uh keep an eye on our instagrams and things like that and but yes that's where i'll be otherwise awesome. in my living room watching the simpsons <laughs> as it should be oh well, that's yes. amazing thank you so much for coming on mate we, we do thank you for having me lads it's very nice to join in come back again soon Thanks very much to Max for coming on to talk about the best episodes of the first two series of The Simpsons. I think we uh, got through some classic episodes there. It's a little bit of crossover, but that's to be expected because some episodes are the real standouts, I suppose. So indeed, bit... indeed. And if if we had all each selected three different episodes and we needed to talk about nine different episodes, it, we would have been we literally would have been been here all night. Um, and I don't think anybody wants that. So, uh, so, so, and, and like I said, it proves that we're we're in sync with each other as Simpsons fans, and and that can't be a bad thing. So, uh, yeah, hope to uh, hope to get Max back for for the season three and four retrospective. Right, as I said, let us know what your thoughts are on that uh, topic, but also any of the other topics we've ever covered. You know where to find us. So please do get in touch. We don't know what we're doing next episode, um, no. so. Don't don't worry about it. <laughs> just just Let come us back. worry about that. You know, yeah, don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah, but it'll be good. Whatever it is, it'll be good. I'm sure. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe there'll be a little bit of present exchanging, uh, or maybe that'll be the episode. Maybe after. in our new yeah. time slot of 9:25 a.m. on yeah on Thursday. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Great. Well, until 9:25 in two weeks' time, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. I'm just off to buy myself an RV from Cowboy Bob. Goodbye. Ta-ta.